Hello, welcome to The Cutting Room, the movie show from all the right movies. I'm John, and the couple of squabbling primates with me are Matt. Hello. And Westy. Hello. Wish I'd throw a bone. Transition. <laughs> <laughs> well, this time round, it's a big one. I mean, I feel like I say that every time. Grand claims like Westy with his 10 out of 10s. <laughs> it's an easy, easy 10 for me. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 out of 10. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but this time round, it is a big one. One of the most acclaimed and influential films to ever come out of Hollywood. We're talking Stanley Kubrick and 2001, A Space Odyssey. Mm. Westy, you put this one up. Though, yeah. actually, I nominated this a while back and you ran away and hid. What changed your mind? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Regretting it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stressed out. <laughs> I, 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 dropped, I dropped the kids off this morning. My mum was like, which, which, what are you recording this afternoon? Which film is it? I was like, oh, 2001. She was like, I don't know why you do this to yourself. <laughs> I was like, hey, thanks, man. Um, it's, it needs to be talked about. It needs, yeah. as daunting as it is, I mean, for any genre, for any filmmaker, for anyone who likes cinema, this is a film that needs to be talked about. Yeah. And you get the term bandied around so much, like style over substance. But this, to me, is it's cinematic form over content, and the cinematic form actually is the content. The style is the substance. Yeah. And there's no other film like that. It's it's just mind-blowing. It's, it's frustrating at times. It takes the piss out of the viewer. It takes the piss out of itself. I don't know what it's about. I still don't. I've seen it in double figures. I don't care. I've tried to come to my own conclusions with it, and I still don't know. And I think Kubrick's just laughing beyond the grave at anyone who's watching this and just cannot figure it out. <laughs> and I know Arthur C. Clarke said, if anyone watches 2001 and figures it out on the first view, and then we have failed. Mm. And I, I'm happy to say they've succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> with all three of us. <laughs> yeah. It's whole world. <laughs> well, my relationship with 2001 was a slow burn. The first time I watched it, I was about 16. It had huge status as a science fiction classic, and I was excited for it. But that first time, I thought, what the hell is this shit? No idea what was going on. Monkeys leaping about, loads of two-minute-long shots of spaceships barely moving, a fetus the size of a planet, like, mental. Yeah. <laughs> But I would always come across filmmakers who I respected praising the film as a masterpiece. So I knew the problem wasn't the film, the problem was me. So I devoured loads of stuff on 2001, listened to interviews, read articles, watched documentaries all over a couple of years. And when I went back to it, it blew my mind. Watched yeah. it endlessly. I went through a phase where I would just have 2001 on in the background. <laughs> like Patrick Bateman with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre doing sit-ups <laughs> really slow sit-ups <laughs> I mean usually I mention the box office and the critical reception of the film around now but 2001 is above all that I don't yeah. normally nail me colours to the mass so early on our episodes but this is a masterpiece so I'm going to be talking about just how much of a masterpiece that I think it is yeah Fair enough. <laughs> and Matt, 2001 and yourself? Just absolutely everything you used to have said. It is daunting. It's it's terrifying. It's kept me awake and I think about, you know, how do I justify having an opinion on yeah. this? I'm not Same worthy man. to have an opinion on this. Yeah. I'm just not. Cut Wayne's World. Get Wayne's World in there on a 2001 episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Clip now. Are you mental? I'd be much happier to talk about that than this. Um, but actually, a bit of personal nostalgia here because the Rankin Kubrick episode we did for the podcast, that's the first ever episode I did with you yeah, guys. Yeah, that's right. And knowing him like I now know him, the thought of Luke watching 2001 <laughs> really makes yes, me laugh. Amazing. Really <laughs> makes me laugh now, now knowing him like I do now. But thinking back to that episode, I think I described this film um, as the Sistine Chapel of science fiction because I am that pretentious. <laughs> so l let's see if I can justify that bold statement. Wow. Let's do it. <laughs> well, open the pod bay doors, Hal. We're exploring 2001, A Space Odyssey. Oh, Jesus Christ. Mm. 
When a mysterious black structure is discovered near a lunar crater, a team of scientists investigate and uncover profound links between humankind's past, present, and future. Bit pretentious, minute. I think that's what I think so. <laughs> Fairly straightforward, isn't it? <laughs> Chronicling the evolution of mankind from tool inventing hominins through spacefaring civilization to omnipotent star child, 2001 A Space Odyssey was directed by Stanley Kubrick, written by Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke, produced by Hawk Films, distributed by MGM, and stars Kia Delay's Dr. David Bowman and Douglas Rain as HAL 9000. So, as ever, on The Cutting Room, we're going to get into the film by discussing in some detail the direction, the writing, the cast, our own highlights, and then we'll give the film a rating out of 10. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No surprises. (laughs) (laughs) The director first, then. One of the biggest directors. Stand the man. It's Kubrick. Already a legend of Hollywood filmmaking by 1968, 2001 was Stanley Kubrick's eighth feature film, and I think it's fair to say his most ambitious and a bit of a departure from what it came before. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> by anyone, not just Kubrick. By anyone, yeah. <laughs> He's left the planet. <laughs> so Matt, how is Kubrick's work on 2001 as the director? Rubbish, right? <sighs> <I mean. laughs> Like, from the dawn of mankind to the next stage of human evolution. Doesn't do things by <laughs> half, does he? No. Like, no. It, it's that scale of ambition, I'm sure, that just boggles my mind. And sometimes we, we say, you know, you can get directors who hold your hand through a film. This is the very opposite. None of that. This is cubic saying, my ambition is this high, and it's up to you to see if you can follow me yeah. or not. Yeah. And every piece of this really disconnected narrative on the face of it manages to feel like its own short film because Kubrick demands the best from it. So the Dawn of Man, that could have been cheesy. That could have been the part that everybody walks out of in laughter because it's guys in ape suits, but it's not. It's done with total conviction. Mm. And just as you start to get a handle on it, like, okay, right, it's this. Bam, you're thrown millions of years forward. And it's like, you're saying, you're right, this is what I want to do. Come on, keep up, keep up. Waltz and spaceships. And then you think, right, I'm on the moon. It's going to be a conspiracy film because they found something and they're going to want to hush it up. There's going to be whistleblower. It's going to be that kind of vibe. And he's so ambitious and this part feels so complete and realistic that, I mean, I don't want to trigger Westy here, but there is that conspiracy theory that NASA faked the moon landing <laughs> yeah. and it was filmed by Kubrick. Yeah. That's how good, that's how realistic this sequence is. That that's, you know, It put that thought in people's heads. But then the monolith reappears, so you sort of connect the pieces back, but then you're straight out of there again. 18 months later, and you're into what's almost like a pure thrill. It's almost a horror film with this homicidal computer mm-hmm. threatening to kill everyone. And in terms of plot description, that could be any NAF 1950 science fiction flick. Yeah. But again, Kubrick, he's just elevating it to the best it can possibly be. Yeah. <laughs> and then once you get a handle on that, he throws you to the end. Trippy, psychedelic, the whole thing looks like the Doctor Who title sequence of that two million <laughs> quid to spend on it. And then a really old man dying in a bed and a massive baby in space. Do I understand it? Not massively. Am I an awful all the same? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you try to pull off the biggest hoax in human history with the moon landing, what you do is hire the most famous director in the world to shoot the video. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hide in plain sight. <laughs> <laughs> Genius. <laughs> the vision that Kubrick had for this film, I think, was further ahead of its time than any film I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Artistically, it's a hell of an achievement. One of the yeah. most beautiful films you could see. Even the concept art, mostly by Robert McCall, is superb. Yeah. As a film, it's so well put together. The pacing and the transitions are like frame perfect. I mentioned she'd also go to Ray Lovejoy, the editor, for that, I think. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to talk now, though about the technical innovations on the film and how influential it's been. There's a lot, and there's no one wants to hear me ramble on all day, so I've picked out my top three 2001 innovations to go through. I I could have gone far, I would have sat through five, (laughs) easy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, third is the slit scan technique they developed for the film. Towards the end, Bowman enters the Stargate, the original Stargate, not the one off Sky One with MacGyver, or whatever he's called. (laughs) <laughs> or the Kurt Russell one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Flat top. 
<laughs> I mean, audiences hadn't seen anything like this before. And the special effects supervisor, Doug Trumbull, had a piece of glass with a slit in the middle. He'd film objects passing behind the glass, and it would seem to stretch the object. That's how they create the Stargate. And it was also used later to create the effect of the Enterprise going into war in Star Trek. <laughs> yes, John. <laughs> of all the things to talk about, you had to get that in there. <laughs> to be a few more Star Trek references, I'm telling you. Shut up, Wesley. Mm. And that psychedelic effect, that apparently led to people dropping acid before going to watch the film. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the 60s. Yeah. A hell of a time. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Innovation 2. 2001 is famous for its majestic and realistic looking shots of the spaceships. And to do that, they developed a technique called motion control. The model ships were moved along tracks at exact speeds, which meant the film crew could then replicate the shot over and over again exactly, which Kubrick would have been loving, I've no doubt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Precision. Yeah. And the track moved at a rate of four inches per minute. I mean, imagine that. Kubrick doing 95 takes of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the shittest skill extra ever. <laughs> <laughs> and... Motion control was then used further by ILM and they developed it more when they made Star Wars in 1977. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And my favourite innovation, the revolving set. Yeah. I mean, we'd seen revolving sets before with people like Fred Astaire dancing on the ceiling, but never Mm -hmm. on this scale. Kubrick wanted anti-gravity scenes in the film, like in the shot of the air hostess walking up the wall and when Poole jogs around the room on board the Discovery. So he commissioned an aeroplane manufacturer called Vickers Armstrong to build a 36-foot centrifuge that cost $750,000. And since then, we've seen a rotating set used by big names like Wes Craven, James Cameron, Christopher Nolan, Lionel Richie. What a few. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, one of the most influential movies ever made, and that's just on the visual effects. Kubrick won an Oscar for the special effects as well, which I think's a bit of a piss take, seeing as he didn't do any of them, but still. Yeah. Mr. Kubrick, unfortunately, cannot be with us tonight. So we'll have his Oscar delivered to Mars, where he is scouting locations for 2002 Space Odyssey Revisited. The only Oscar it won as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. 13 nominations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Extraordinary stuff from an extraordinary film. And Westy. Kubrick here for you as director. Ah, oh, I mean, it's just, it's just, he's a master of everything. Yeah. I mean, Jeffrey Unsworth said all he had to do was just go in and just follow his blueprints. He's just put a light there, do that, do that there, put that there, and then, you know, shoot mm. it like that with this lens on this camera. It's ridiculous, his work on this. <laughs> it's just fucking ridiculous. I'm sorry, but he's just got such control over everything, and he's ripping the piss, and there's so much. <laughs> I said, well, what am I going to look at for this for Kubrick? I said, I'm going to look at shape within the film. How that's a visual metaphor. There's a lot of circles which represent lenses or they represent the circle of life, they represent evolution. But there's also a really great manipulation of colour, which I'm going to call the CMYK theory, Wesley's Theory 1. Get that up there. (laughs) (laughs) CMYK is cyan, yellow, magenta and key, which key is essentially black. Now, if you look at the three spacesuits, they are cyan, magenta and yellow. CMYK is a printing process for physical pictures, which Kubrick was a photographer before this, mainly black and white, but he knows how physical pictures are made. Yeah, Just put yeah. all them colours together, you get a photorealistic image. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So what he's explaining is, the astronauts in this are basically showing you a realistic view of something that you can't believe, and you're looking at it in a realistic way. The monolith itself is 2.2 by 1, a widescreen, right? Yeah. So we're basically watching the film, in the film. And then the kids were over last night, so I was like, I need a break from, from Kubrick, right? <laughs> so what am I watch? Right, I put this on. I've got it on DVD. BMX Bandits, right? <laughs> Three protagonists, right, are red, yellow, and blue. So <laughs> lovely. Brian Trenchard Smith's BMX Bandits is heavily influenced by 2001 A Space Odyssey. I've always thought Right? <laughs> Fuck off, man, Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, man and that's just one thing it's just an absolute maze of genius like yeah. if you get that far into it this could kill somebody you just sit there you just be like fucking 2001 and that's going to be me in about five years time if I watch it anymore I've got to have a break from it it's a fucking masterpiece and he's a genius and the only other thing that I got from this doing research on it is that the chess artificial intelligence that they had on set was crap mm-hmm. and Kubrick kept beating it and yeah. I got this and I'm going to use this all the time and he kept calling the software a bumbling pisswit 
which is <laughs> fucking <laughs> music. <laughs> you get a pint there, you bumbling piss with. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great insult. <laughs> fucking flawless. Sorry if I went on too long, but it's 2001. What am I going to do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, visually, 2001, we've mentioned it already, obviously a big influence on Star Wars, wasn't it? Yeah, massive. And I mean, Star Wars came out the decade after 2001, and when you compare the two, ILM did push things on from where 2001 left them. But when you compare 2001 to science fiction films from the decade earlier, the 50s, it's mm, ridiculous yeah. how far 2001 yeah, yeah. raised the bar. Those films looked like Button Moon in comparison to 2001. <laughs> yeah, it really yeah. did, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, the cinematography, the opening shot of the eclipse, the shot that looks up the monolith, the shot of Haywood, mm. the scientist's hand touching the monolith, Bowman walking down the octagonal corridor. I mean, what an eye he's got just for a shot. It's not a bad shot, is it? As well as that, though, there's just some proper old school movie magic to this as well, though, like those rotating sets you've mentioned, John, mm. obviously groundbreaking. But that scene where the horse has catches the floating pen, that's just a sheet of glass, and the pen is stuck to it with uh, double sided sticky tape, which had just been invented <laughs> then. So there you go. There's your anti gravity. Yeah. Sheet of glass. Like Blue Peter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's one I made earlier. And talking about innovations, I mean, Kubrick was the king of innovation. Another way he was innovative was his use of product placement. You wanted to create a realistic future, so you having no brand logos anywhere would be odd. So you got companies to provide certain aspects of the film. Hamilton did the wristwatches, and IBM did the computer systems. But if you might, you know Hal, if you put Hal one letter forward, it's IBM. Yeah, yeah that's right. Apparently it was an accident. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, but we didn't mean that, of course you didn't. What, what does Stanley Kubrick do that he doesn't mean to do? Yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> but then, yeah, this was taken on in, in Blade Runner, Fight Club, anything else where you see, like, real product placement, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in Blade Runner, you can't help but see the neon brand logos in that. Yeah, Atari, mm. yeah. Yeah, and in Fight Club, Fincher, another maniac, he apparently includes a Starbucks cup in every scene. Right, every scene. I've heard apparently, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that kind of corporate brand-based visual satire started, yeah, yeah. with 2001. Mm. Did he do that episode of Game of Thrones then? <laughs> <laughs> Got to talk about the music as well, though. That's yeah. used to classical music. Just inspired. Or I do know at one point he, they'd approach Pink Floyd to do the score, but they said no. <laughs> they said no and then wrote Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> <laughs> Scored the Wizard of Oz instead. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> So at the end of doing the hide, this composer called Alex North, who composed the original score, even though Kubrick was never going to use it. He only <laughs> ever wanted to use classical, but he just didn't tell North that. North only found out when he turned up at the premiere, oh, like expecting it, nightmare. like he was score booming out. Nah, not a bit of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want people dropping acid, you get Pink Floyd in, surely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. surely. Yeah, Georgie Ligeti features prominently on the soundtrack, but most famously, mm. I think, it's the Strauss Boys, Richard and Johan. Yes. Thus Sprogue Zarathustra opens the film and the Blue Danube after the three million year cut. I mean, mm, those pieces yeah. are so massive and legendary that to create visuals worthy of that music without coming across as pretentious as hell is no yeah. mean feat. Mm. I think like <laughs> yeah. so much of the film, Kubrick's ambition is just sky high. And not only does he pull it off, he makes it look kind of easy as well. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's accessible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow. I don't know. Yeah. The costumes were designed by Hardy Amys, a Savile Row fashion designer who's designed outfits for the Queen, believe it or not, since her coronation wow. in 1952. He designed the space hostess costumes, which are fucking great. Awesome. Um, the civilian costumes, everything just, just fits into the environment that they're in. It's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And the space suits and everything. He said Kubrick wanted to sign off every aspect of every costume, like down to the buttons, yeah. the lapels, yeah. all of it. How can you be asked for that level of detail? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Apparently, Her Majesty said, if it's good enough for Kubrick, he's good enough for it's me. It's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the costume designs are outstanding. They're like timeless. They still look like a possible future now. I mean, this film is just aged like the finest of wines, I think, in every aspect. Yeah, even the furniture's been replicated now. That looks kind of modern. Yeah. Kubrick's directing then. He combines technical innovations with stunning artistry and does both to a level really matched in Hollywood. Never again. Yes. Never again. As was the case on many of his films, Kubrick didn't hand over screenwriting duties to somebody else entirely, and 2001 was a co-writing credit between Stanley the Manly and Arthur C. Clarke. A widely respected futurist writer, Clarke is one of the most acclaimed science fiction authors in history, and 2001 sits among his most revered works. What everyone wants to know, though, 
what does Westy think of the writing? <laughs> what everyone wants to know. Yeah. Um, I think it's brilliant because it's so simple a premise. Yeah. You know, there's evolution. That there's this monolith, right? Okay, they found it again. There's a monolith, right? Okay, they found something on Jupiter. Let's go there and fi- figure out what this thing finally is, and that's it. But I think what's really interesting about the writing is that not a lot of people know that the novel and the screenplay were written at the same time. And I think it's worth noting a few differences from the novel and the film. Hal was four years old in the book and nine years old in the film. Right. The way he malfunctions in the book is actually explained. His actually AI was told to lie about the mission, but he has an internal conflict knowing that he has to kind of tell the truth. So that's how he malfunctions and, and it uh-huh. breaks. Uh, the monolith showed the apes how to tie knots, how what a weapon was. Evolution's actually explained from the, the from where we are. It doesn't do that incredible jump cut. But you'll have two sides of the puzzle which intercalate, but I think Clark wasn't told as much as Kubrick wanted him to know, which is classic Kubrick, really. Yeah, imagine trying to write alongside Kubrick. He's just changing things as he goes along and not telling you. <laughs> <Yeah>. Really slowly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean... We could talk about the writing of this film for the entire episode easily, yeah. but yeah. I'm going yeah. to focus on the narrative structure, as I think that covers a lot of the great things in the writing. Mm-hmm. I mean, the concept, as we've said, to tell the story of the entire history of the human race, it's surely the most ambitious piece of writing ever put on film by Hollywood. Somehow, Kubrick and Clark pull it off, and again, they make it look far too easy for my liking. <laughs> Not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> Not happy about it. <laughs> They split the film into four distinct parts, three of which have titles. That makes some people say it's a three-act structure, but it's not. At least not a three-act structure as it's being taught by people like Robert McKay or Sid Field. No, no, no. Kubrick and Clark basically take the storytelling rulebook and rip it to shreds. I mean, firstly, there's not a word of dialogue for the first 25 minutes of the film. And there's not a word of dialogue for the last 23 minutes of the film. I mean, what are they playing at with that? <laughs> and there's other key scenes, like when the scientists visit the monolith on the moon, drawn out, deliberately paced, no dialogue. The main character is Bowman. He's the protagonist, apparently, and doesn't show up until 57 minutes into the film. <laughs> the first time I saw 2001, I'd heard that the main character didn't appear until an hour in, and when we get to the future, I was like... Is Leonard Rossiter the main character in 2001? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Jones! <laughs> my God! I think my favourite thing, though, is how Kubrick doesn't explain anything. Doesn't even try. Mm. He just presents stuff as it is and allows us to interpret it. We don't know why Hal started trying to kill the crew. We don't know where Bowman is at the end of the film. We don't know yeah. what the Star Child is. This is one of the things that makes 2001 what it is, and also, I think, is the reason a lot of people don't like it. Because yeah. it presents ideas and doesn't definitively explain them. The film demands yeah. your participation. The more you have to bring to the table with 2001, yeah. the more you take from it. I can't think of any other mm. Hollywood film that does that to this level. They've basically redefined the form for me. And yet again, yeah. they've made it look kind of easy to do that. Yeah. Every creative decision on the film is made by an artist for artistic reasons. The name mm-hmm. of the film might be inspired by Home and the Odyssey, but the writing is very unique. Extraordinary mm. in my yeah. eyes. It rewards patience, the whole thing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Matt, what do you think of the writing in the film? Mm. I think because it's it's so concept-driven, this film, it's easy to overlook the characters and the dialogue, and I think critics of the film latch onto that of anything, go, oh, yeah. dialogue is rubbish, characters are boring. Actually, I think there's something clever going on with both of those. I mean, the dialogue, I discovered this term the other day, there's something called fatic dialogue, which basically means language without meaning. So, mm-hmm. like, as an example, if you work in an office and you go in in the morning, and you're like, hi, how are you, good morning? That's fatic dialogue because it doesn't mean anything. Mr. Toad. In 2001, it's full of it. You know, the chit-chat on the moon base, that goes nowhere. That call Floyd makes to his daughter on her birthday. The worst phone call any dad has ever made to their child on their birthday. <laughs> it's rubbish. I'll try to telephone again tomorrow. <laughs> but it, it's that way deliberately. And the point Kubrick is making is he's contrasting throughout the film our behaviour to this alien intelligence that's moving the film along. So at the beginning, when we as still to say it's all we can do is grunt at each other, Millions of years in the future, have we evolved? Not really, mm-hmm. not from the perspective of the aliens. So still just grunting yeah, away yeah. at each other, <laughs> and it means yeah. nothing. And it's the same with the characters. There's no protagonist, really, in this film. No one has an arc. We know nothing about anyone. And again, usually you would criticise that, but that's the point compared to whatever else is out there. 
pushing us along. We are nothing. They want us to evolve beyond humanity to them. We are just insects. And it's like us saying, oh, you know, why doesn't that ant have a character arc in the film? Well, because it's an ant. It's an insect. Mm. It doesn't offer anything. You are insignificant. And that's the point. All these, like, petty dramas and crises we have as humans, the things you get in regular dramas. Doesn't matter in 2001. All that stuff is irrelevant. This alien intelligence, they need us to hurry up and evolve to, to the next great stage where we might actually be useful. So I think there's a lot going on with the dialogue and the characters than it's often given credit for. Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke first became aware of the project when he received a telegram from MGM in 1963 that basically said, Stanley Kubrick's doing a film about aliens and wants to know if you'd like to be involved. Also, he wants to know if you're still a recluse. <laughs> <laughs> And Clark was like, eh, I've never been a recluse. What's he talking about? <laughs> so 2001 was originally going to be a series of short stories set in space, but Clark had the idea of basing it on one of his own. Yeah, it was called The Sentinel. Have any of you guys read that? No, no. Me neither. I didn't really see the point. Um, about an alien, <laughs> <laughs> an alien artifact being found on the moon. He, re- he wrote it in 1948 for a BBC competition and um, was then published in a lowbrow pulp rag called Ten Story Fantasy. The cover story was called Tyrant and the Slave Girl on Planet Venus, which sounds mint. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. Mr. Trick not setting that on Uranus, I think. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 They also, for 2001, took some plot points from a 1955 film called Conquest of Space. They took some visual ideas from it as well, like the circular space station. But obviously it looks a bit better in 2001. Well, yeah. After Button Moon, we follow Mr. Spoon Button Moon. The thing is, though, for like this film is about an alien intelligence that still wanted to ground it in as much realism as possible and actually... I mean, by fluke or whatever, but they've ended up predicting a lot of technologies and innovations yeah. we are seeing as well. For example, video screens, like commonplace now, aren't there? It's like a common way of communicating. That was like, you know, predicting the future back then, wasn't it? Yeah, we see Dr. Floyd talking to his daughter via a screen. Mm-hmm. His daughter's played mm-hmm. by Kubrick's daughter, Vivian, who was five at the time. Yeah. And as well, when you see um, the pilots using screens and digital readouts, absolute fancy back in 68, but again, completely commonplace now. Yeah, also in-flight personal TVs. Not a thing at the time, and now commonplace mm-hmm. again. I'm furious when I don't get one of them on a flight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just the worst thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's the same with the, the Jupiter mission. Bowman and Poole use an electronic tablet to carry our tasks, and they look like, you know, the iPads we have today as well. They do, yeah. Apparently Steve Jobs said, it's good enough for Kubrick. Good enough for me. <laughs> Loads of that. <laughs> Everyone's just saying that. <laughs> well, a bit when they're eating the dinner, though, and they're watching the interview, like, that's now. Isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah it's just yeah. now. <laughs> and then HAL as well, obviously an operating system which all modern computers have now and, you know, just look at your Alexa. You know, Alexa is HAL. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just make sure she can't read your lips. <laughs> yeah. Alexa. <laughs> 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 so the screenplay for 2001 rips up the narrative rule book and explores some of the biggest themes seen on the big screen and somehow mm-hmm. does all of it successfully. Oh, yeah. Somehow. We've been talking relentlessly about Kubrick so far, and a bit about Arthur C. Clarke, but believe it or not, there is a cast in 2001 as well. Yeah, there's more yes, people there involved. <laughs> <laughs> and Westy and Matt, you're going to tell us all about a couple of them right now, I think. Mm. So, who are you going for, Westy? I'll go for Kia DeLay, who plays David Bowman, Dr. David Bowman. Um, <laughs> Full title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he's fantastic in this. He's just so, so good. But he's got one of them faces, hasn't he, where it's like... Is he actually human, or is he just being formed <laughs> as a human, just to throw you off the scent? He's just like, yeah. Kind of doesn't, yeah. yeah, I love his 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 kind of demeanor. He doesn't really react to anything, you know, mm-hmm. to the point where it, like a human would panic. There's no real sense of panic with the character, and I think if you get a human being to act like that, which Kubrick is is getting him to act like that, that's his under his direction, you know. And it's got this real weird kind of tangibility to his performance. It's very very grounded and very solid and you want to follow him through and when he, even when he's going through the Stargate he's not like screaming and bah! you know like it's not like a over the top performance where he's just it's just a, uh, ah, he's just losing it slightly doesn't lose it when he sees himself older yeah. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't really react to that I think it's just brilliant It's it, I don't know anyone else who could have done this this well mm. he's just brilliant and I've only seen him in Black Christmas after this I've not seen ah, him in anything yeah. else yeah 
But I think he just owns this. This is it. This is his mm. performance. He's done 2001. He came back for the sequel, didn't he? Yeah. Which I haven't seen. Hello, Dr. Floyd. This performance takes the film to the next level for me because it's a very visual performance. It's not necessarily emotional where he's trying to drag you into anything. He's just basically... This is a human being, by the way. This is what they look like now. Mm. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it, it's disorientating at some points, but really beautifully done. I think his performance is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he's the main character, but it's not really about him at all. I don't think nah. Bowman's here as a representation of humanity. It's he who has to take on Hal, defeats the artificial intelligence on behalf of humanity, and it's he yeah. who transforms into the next level of humanity when he evolves. Is Kia Delay mm. essential to the film's success? Absolutely not. Is no, he not at all. brilliant in the role? I wouldn't say particularly for me, but hey, I mean, he's in there as the lead in one of the most influential films ever made, and he's perfectly good, so good for him. Yeah, but there's no ego to him. There's no ego to oh, him none. at all as an actor or a character. And that's kind of special if you're in a film this big to not yeah. have demands and say, I want more dialogue, I want more emotion, I want to see me scale, I want people to see what I can do. Yeah, He's just kind of going, okay, I'll do that. And that that's that's really, you know, you should respect that really, I think, from an actor. Yeah, yeah. imagine trying that with Kubrick though. No. <laughs> <laughs> trying it with Iron Jim. <laughs> Should have had less lines on Titanic. If Titanic was like this, had less lines. Yeah. That... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Matt, there's only one person left for you to cover, I think, isn't there? Leonard Rossiter. Rossiter. <laughs> <laughs> 900 words on there. Rossiter's performed, setting up a meeting. He's so great. It. He is great. <laughs> no, I think like every human performance in this film is is kind of like buttoned down and, and almost dull, but deliberately so. Yeah. yeah. Put in the hand. I'll tell you what said about the writing. Mankind is dull, so the performance should be like that. So I think it's it's very deliberately ironic that Hal the computer system with a completely flat and neutral voice is the best performance in the film. Yeah. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Is the most interesting character it's in the, the film. It's the most emotional character in the film. Most yeah. emotional by far. That's the point. And that is 100% intentional because, again, it's Kubrick saying, look at mankind. We're not even as interesting as the computers that we make. They're more interesting than us. <laughs> and it's it's a very different type of performance to talk about Douglas Fancy because it's not the type where you can go, oh, that bit's great. It's really amazing when he did that, and that's really funny. So really, all I can add to what I've said so far is that for a performance that is so neutral in tone throughout, it's still a performance that manages to be extremely creepy. Dave, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. When Hal slowly flips out and you don't realise it, it just winds the film up with this tension. Like the sense that you can't get away from him. He's watching everything. But weirdly, everything in that monotone can be very funny. When he goes, without, without your, your space, space helmet, helmet, Dave, you're going, going to, to find, find that, that rather, rather difficult. <laughs> like, that line really cracks me up. There's something really funny about that. You know? I love the fact he calls him Dave as well. Yeah, it's great. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> calls, Hello, Dave. Yeah, it's Dave's out. Brilliant. You'd probably call me Westy. Like, It'd be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> What's weird, though, the original conception for Hal was he was going to be like a mobile robot on legs, right. a bit like Robbie the Robot from the 50s, <laughs> yeah. or like Lost in Space, that type of thing. But... You are even more stupid than I first computed. Clark was right that that idea would get outdated really quickly, which is why they just changed it to that all and i Works much better, obviously. Yeah. It does, yeah. I mean, Doug the Three does a fantastic job. His voice is pretty perfect. Yeah. The all eye yeah. is surely a nod to the Cyclops, I think, from the Odyssey. But Hal was mm-hmm. originally going to be called Socrates. After oh, the right. Greek philosopher or the Brazilian footballer, maybe one of the two. Socrates still. Oh, Socrates! <laughs> <laughs> so great. <laughs> 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 and that was then changed to Athena with a female voice, and Kubrick tried out Stephanie Powers. A female voice could have been great, I think. All right, yeah, yeah. But Clark then settled on HAL 9000. But do you know what HAL stands for? Like, as an acronym, I mean, not like politically. Oh, All right. Right. Like, um, <laughs> something artificial life isn't it am I close no <laughs> no <Okay. laughs> it stands for heuristically programmed algorithmic computer obviously but that's not an L I know yeah where's the L come from oh well he's did you see what I mean the AL comes from algorithmic computer apparently oh, fuck ah. <laughs> There were other actors considered, though, before they settled on Reigns, so Nigel Davenport was the first, but then Kubrick decided his British accent was too distracting, 
<laughs> not sure what he means by that, but you know, you're not going to question him, are you? Yeah. Too distracted. What accent was he? There. Scouser. <laughs> <laughs> Dave! Dave! <laughs> <laughs> That's my <murder. laughs> Then um, after Davenport, they went a really different direction. Then uh, Martin Balsam, Arbogast and Psycho, he was next. But then, then Kubik thought he was too colloquially American, so he was fired. Wow. Um, but then Kubik apparently watched this documentary called Universe. Beyond the appearance starshine and moonbeam what will the first men to leave the earth find then the narrator's voice really stood out which is douglas rain so that's where he got the job from basically but right. he did all his dialogue in post so up until the day he died in i think it was 2018 he had never met or spoken to kia Dilly. wow wow mm. bit lazy in it <laughs> could have went for one drink in 50 <laughs> years surely <laughs> <laughs> the premier to score that maybe <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> When Nigel Davenport played Hal, he was there on set reading lines with the actors, so Kubrick fired him three weeks from the end of production and Hal's lines were then read by the assistant director, Derek Cracknell. He had a really strong Cockney accent and the actors struggled <laughs> to understand him. That would be amazing. <laughs> Get Winston in there. You're lucky I'll turn up, Jonesy. They've think they wanted to blow your brains out. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Rain came in in order to soften his voice he recorded his lines barefoot with his feet resting on a pillow but that's also because he was really nervous and he kept tapping his foot and it was coming across so Kubrick like said but teach you there's a pillow right to tap as much as you want now and then that's how he got his lines across brilliant cool, right, yeah. Cotney Hall though she got Dick Van Dyke in there. This is what you might call a fortuitous circumstance. <laughs> she got Trigger from Only Fields calling him Dave all the time. <laughs> Watch right, her die. <laughs> Get Hoskins in there. <laughs> Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Dave. There is a bigger cast in there, of course. Laird Rossiter very nearly steals the show. Also... Yeah. Gary Lockwood as Dr. Poole plays a significant part, mm -hmm. as does Daniel Richter yeah, as Moonwatcher, the primate. Yeah. In those main mm -hmm. two, though, Kia Delea leads things successfully, and Douglas Wayne especially, I think, makes his mark on the film. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, definitely. The highlights from 2001 is a tricky thing. Not easy to pick out mm -hmm. specific scenes, so we're each going to talk about one of the main narrative sections. So, Matt, mm -hmm. which are you going for? I'm going to start at the beginning because imagine 1960 year, right? You go to see this film. 2001, a space odyssey. <laughs> Loads of spaceships on the poster. Yes. And then this is your first scene. Yeah. Like, the dawn of <laughs> what the fuck am I watching? Wait, where's the spaceships? Why are the loads of apes running around? Yeah. What? Leopard What's going with on? light of eyes. What's going on? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. But, but, like, I'll say something else. 1968, you also had Planet of the Apes release, which, you know, I yeah. like. It's a good film, but they look nothing like apes in the film. No. <laughs> this is what apes look like. Yeah. yeah. Like, the costume design and the acting, absolutely sensational. And that open a bit when them get slept on by a leopard. <laughs> That's yeah. terrifying. It actually that. leapt on as well, though. Like, it goes yeah. for it. actually leapt on. Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous. I mean, that's proper David Attenborough stuff. It is. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And this is how they spend most of their time, lounging on the ground, grooming one another. I mean, it looks incredible, but I think as you're watching it, Space Odyssey, okay, not so much as Space Odyssey yet, but it's fine. I'm, you know, I'm into this kind of, like these apes. <laughs> there's a lot of space here, in this Odyssey. There's a lot of space. <laughs> yeah, not so much Odyssey yet. Yeah. But then the monolith turns up, and I've also, whenever it does, 2001, it goes in a proper, like, horror film territory when right. these turn up, because it's the mystery of what the hell are these things. They look scary. They look intimidating. The fact they've come out of nowhere, that soundtrack is amazing. That wailing that comes with it really, really puts him on edge to yeah. find stuff yeah. but also in the sequence it's it's one of my favorite performances with one of these apes because you know when you go to a restaurant and you order food and the waiter brings it out and he goes oh don't touch the plate though because it's red hot and you go is it though i'm gonna have a little touch <laughs> oh, oh, oh it is yeah. that's what one of the apes doing i love it. he's just touching the monolith and then jumping yeah. back and forth and he's gonna like to prod it again yeah then he ends up sniffing it which you know probably understandable so just like you in a restaurant then <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> sniffing, all, sniffing prod and that's all i do sniffing prod so like when you think about it absolutely mental opening for a film Crazy. but what an opening all the same <laughs> insane yeah, I mentioned some of the technical innovations on 2001 a bit earlier, and there was another here called Front Projection in the Tone of Man sequence. That was where they had a huge projector that projected images of the African plains via a one-way mirror behind the actors, and that creates images with a depth of field that looks 100% real to me. Yeah, it does. Just like the yeah, moon landing. 
<laughs> and then Richard Donner used from projection to make Superman fly, and it's a forerunner of mm. green screen, which is used today to create real looking digital images in Marvel films, Avatar films, stuff yeah. like that, Attack of the Clones, mm -hmm. films like that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a sequence where we see the monolith for the first time. Kubrick's first idea for the monolith, as I've said, is that it would be a screen that actually showed the apes how to turn objects mm. into tools. And Arthur C. Clarke right. thought it was t like too naive, so changed it to a black uh, tetrahedron. What kind of shape? Is that like a triangle? Pyramid? You know, it, pyramid. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. okay. Yeah, um, pyramid, yeah. So they built one, but it didn't reflect the light properly, so they tried a cube, Stanley Kubrick. And that didn't how, that didn't reflect the light very well. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Um, and then two tone plexiglass monolith was created, but after it was built, Kubrick decided that he didn't like it anymore and binned it completely. <laughs> so finally, they settled on the large black rectangle. They say, "I think he's just taking them round the houses here to go." I want a cinema screen anyway. The light doesn't reflect very well. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my view on it. Yeah, I love the design of the monolith that we do get. It's like yeah, so anonymous. I know the idea, obviously, yeah. is that it's been left there by aliens, but I always take it as, because it's not explained, you can also take it as a metaphor of just the moment, whatever it was, that triggered apes beginning to evolve into humans. The most important mm -hmm. point yeah. for me is that the apes learn how to use tools and immediately use them to open a kind of whoop us on everybody. Huge <laughs> statement yeah. from Kubrick, that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> really human, though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like that's, that's, if that's the one thing you're going to learn to progress and evolve is violence, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a strong statement. Got to talk about that match cut as well, though. Oh, it yeah. takes from Dawn of Mana three million years later. Ridiculous. But I think a lot of people miss the fact that what we could do, it isn't a spaceship, it's a nuclear bomb yeah. orbiting the Earth. So we could, from the first weapon, the board, to the ultimate weapon of mass destruction in the future. Well, and the original idea for the film is that Star Child at the end would detonate all the bombs at the end of the film, destroying the Earth. But Kubrick's previous film was Dr. Strangelove. Yeah, yeah. So he just he didn't want to repeat that. himself, so he yeah. changed it. Right, yeah, Viral N playing again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing, that. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing primates do with tool building knowledge is make a weapon, and then the cut, our take, is telling us that mindset leads directly to our conquest of space as well. I mean, what a transition, that is. That's yeah. the best ever. But yeah. just imagine how long Kubrick spent on that cut. Ray Lovejoy would have been going mental, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> We've got it, man. Stanley. takes of just the bone being thrown in the air as well, though. Yeah. He yeah. did that walking back to the studio because they did that on location. It was basically Kubrick just throwing it up and the handheld yeah. camera wow. just going up and down and he just kept doing it on the walk back until he was like, just do it. Just did it all the way, like two miles. Just kept throwing <laughs> it up, down, throwing it up, have like two miles. Guys, oh, God. <laughs> Jeffrey Unsworth, right? Yeah. Stanley, what are you oh, doing? Jesus. <laughs> but that's how they got it. That's how they got it. So the apes, we say, are a bunch of mimes and dancers dressed in costumes. Amazing costumes, should yeah. I say. And there's yeah. two baby chimps, too. And Kubrick worked with makeup artists called Stuart Freeborn to create the costumes. The first costumes weren't as hairy, and Kubrick was threatened with an X rating. I mean... <laughs> there's no need for that level of detail just you know leave it but Freeburn used Ronnie Corbett as a makeup model I love that. <laughs> unfortunately though he's not in the film which I'm quite sorry about if you understand that that's goodbye very nice <laughs> yeah. you mentioned Stuart Freeborn there as well do you know who that is? I don't, but you're going to tell us I'm going to kick myself. The name's familiar, yeah. A few years later, he went on to design the look of Yoda for The Empire Strikes Back. Oh, oh right. of course he did. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. based Yoda's face on his own face as well. Yes, right, yes. He that does picture. look like him. Yeah, yeah. is that the yeah, guy? Right, does. amazing. Wow. <laughs> so for my highlight, I'm taking on the second section of the film, the Jupiter mission on board the ship, the Discovery. We see some extraordinary shots on the ship. This is where Hal really comes into it too, and he's obviously involved in some of the film's most memorable moments. Where he catches Bowman and Poole conspiring against him by reading their lips. Hal killing Poole and the three scientists in stasis is massive, but the scene for me mm. is where Bowman shuts down Hal. Yeah. He gets back into the ship, heads to Hal's processor core, and starts stripping out his circuits one by one. The scene is scored by the sound of Bowman's breathing. And that's actually Kubrick's breathing that we hear. Yeah, it is, yeah. 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 And yeah, that yeah. low angle as well, all the way through. Oh, incredible. Mm. It's fantastic. But Hal, who's been this cold, calculated killer to this point, he tries to threaten Bowman. Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? Then tries to reason with him. I know I've made some very poor decisions recently. And then starts basically begging for his life. Will you stop, Dave? 
And then yeah. as Bowman looks at more of Hal's circuits, his mind and memories, Hal reverts to his factory settings, which is like his childhood, basically. And he sings yeah. Daisy Bell. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to. I mean, the thing's being said here. If Hal's conscious and aware and has memories and the ability to reason and manipulate and doesn't want to die and has a childhood, how was he any different to us, really? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm asking you, Westy, how was Hal 9000 different to us? <laughs> he wasn't. He was more real than... He's more human than we actually were. And it should have been Ronnie Corbett. <laughs> <laughs> and Ronnie Parker. And Ronnie Parker just like two eyes. <laughs> two Ronnies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, this scene, Bowman and Hal, never before has a filmmaker shown so little and made me think so much. It's one of the mm-hmm. most extraordinary scenes I've ever seen. In a film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The song that Hal sings is Daisy Bell, written in 1892 by a songwriter called Henry Dacre. They used the song for a reason. It was the first ever recording of a computer singing a song. It was IBM's, obviously, uh, 1794 in 1961. I love the song. I think it's great. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not whacking it on any time soon. Like I'm not getting up vinyl. <laughs> well, Arthur C. Clarke came across a demonstration of that computer singing in 1962, so wrote it into the script. And when you read the original script, Clarke had Hal singing all sorts of other things as well. But Cooper took all those out, but he left Daisy Bell. I mean, when Clarke came up with that using Daisy Bell, he must have been like, "God, that's awesome." What an awesome idea. <laughs> <laughs> it is a really brilliant idea, the way it all yeah. comes for, again, full circle, metaphorically. Yeah. The bit I also love, though, is where Bowman gets back onto the ship because Cubic plays have a total realism because of the vacuum of space. He's fired back onto the ship and there's no noise, so Cubic just cuts it to silence. And I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah, you'd probably expect to hear like a hiss or an explosion or something. I mean, that alone must have blown people's minds seeing that in 1968. Yeah, yeah I mean, the use of silence in this film is unprecedented. Yeah. The way he just cuts from something to nothing and it's just silent. It's yeah. it's eerily silent. Mm. Like in the cinema, people would be, oh, yeah. what yeah. on earth? Especially if you're off your head on acid. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the, when the malfunction comes in, when they, when he kills the guys, like, bah, bah, bah. Like, what? Fuck. <laughs> Silence. He's doing it on purpose. He knows for a fact what he's doing. It's fucking great. Well, Wesley, what's your highlight from the film? Well, it's going to have to be the end, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's just so me. <laughs> um, <laughs> When we see that Stargate and the way the, the camera, as I've said, just rotates and then we start seeing landscapes, eyes close up, landscapes again, which are actually outtakes from Doctor Strangelove that the shot. Right, oh, okay. Right. That actually, to me, looks like a negative. This whole Stargate sequence looks like a negative being developed. It's, again, on my theory that this is actually about filmmaking, as if the negatives is burned. There's the seven diamonds that come up. This was shot on a Panavision 70, so you get seven inverted squares. There's all these little bits you can tap into, but then when you get to that room, I think this is the first time that you think, that's a film set. Yeah. This doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. When he breaks the glass, I don't think that's a sign to say it's there's gravity here. I think it's a sign that he's reaching out and he almost touches the bottom of the screen. He almost reaches out of the monolith that you're seeing. I think that's the reason. Mm-hmm. He, and the glass stops him from reaching any further, and that's really important. And then when he's in the bed and he's looking at the monolith, he... he physically kind of touches the screen if you see it in 2d which we do and then as he does that it returns back to the form of the start when he's eating his dinner as well if you look at the, the back shot of him that painting above him yeah. is cyan magenta yellow Lovely. and key mm. it, and you get the credits and we're watching the credits it says the end after the credits so the credits are part of the film the part of the monolith the part ah, of the right, screen yeah, okay. that we're seeing all the mm. way through Kubrick must have been pissing himself. He's like, they're actually the apes at the start. That's what you're watching. It's brilliantly done. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic stuff. And that's my take on it. Should it be whatever. It's a good take. I mean, I mentioned mm-hmm. earlier at the start that there's no explanation for what's going on in this final sequence with Bowman. And there isn't in the movie. But years later, Kubrick did explain what his intentions were. He is uh, taken in by uh, godlike entities, uh, creatures of pure uh, energy and intelligence with no shape or form. They uh, put him uh, in what I suppose you could describe as a human zoo to study him, and he spends he, his whole life passes from that point on in that room. Anyway, when they get finished with him, he is transformed into some kind of super being and sent back to um, Earth. It is uh, 
genius or the ramblings of a madman? I think he's not going <laughs> to give you anything that's straightforward. He's never no. given you the answer to anything straightforward. He doesn't. That's not his. That's not his play. His play is always, you know, he's, he's four moves ahead of you. He's a chess master. He knows exactly what he's yeah. doing. And he's putting that thought into your mind to push it away from the other one. He's like, I tell you, if I, if I tell people the alien theory, then in 30 years' time, people are actually going to figure out what I'm actually talking about. Yeah. This is a legacy. This film is a legacy <laughs> because people continuously talk about it. And that's what he wanted them to do. Yeah, we're all bumbling pisswits compared to Stan the Man. <laughs> bumbling <laughs> pisswits. <love it. laughs> Yes, one thing Kubrick and Clark did as well, they approached famous astrophysicist Carl Sagan at one point, get his opinion oh, yeah. on how the aliens should appear on screen. And the first thing Sagan did was tell Kubrick, well, aliens, they're very unlikely to have any kind of resemblance to, to mankind or to humans. So to go down that route would take away from the realism they're aiming for. The second idea was that the film should only suggest the presence of alien interference rather than short out right, which is what we do get. So Sagan must have just been absolutely delighted to see Kubik take his opinion so seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, an inspired choice. Not seeing the aliens leads it to our imagination, which is much better. And it means that even if and when alien life is discovered, 2001 will not feel outdated. It'll remain unaffected. <laughs> yeah. Just timeless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like Kubrick manages to cover the history of the human race in three titled sections, we managed to cover 2001 in three huge opinions. <laughs> <laughs> but all very similar. It all kind of ties yeah. together. An equally impressive achievement, I think you'll agree, John. <laughs> equally impressive. <laughs> At least. <laughs> yeah. Those highlights, though, all part of movie history? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Westy, you chose this one, so I'm coming to you first. Summary and score out of 10 for 2001 A Space Odyssey. Okay. I mean, it's I'm not going to mess about. It's Everyone knows what I'm going to say because I've said it so many times before. <laughs> um, it's influenced so many filmmakers from this point. Spielberg said this was the one that kick-started everybody to just kind of, you know, get a hold of what they're doing and create something great. Mm -hmm. now, it's going to be puzzled over for, for generations and generations of people. It's a, it's a masterpiece of cinema. It's a masterpiece of filmmaking. It's, it's Kubrick's masterpiece and his opus and it what a legacy to leave it hasn't yeah. aged i don't think it ever will it's so brilliant it's so a 10 easy <laughs> to the surprise of no one there i think no, <laughs> not at all not Definitely at all not. well the word i've used a lot is extraordinary and i think that's what this film is the cinematography and visuals it presented images of space travel to a relative level that's never been matched for me I don't think any film has ever came out and raised the bar within its own genre as much as 2001 did. The visual effects were groundbreaking, the writing, its ambition and the themes it explores are huge. And it does that while tearing up the rule book on how to tell a story. It's yeah. one of Hollywood's greatest works of art. It's one of the most influential films of all time. And to me, it's the most extraordinary film ever made. To give this a score mm -hmm. seems pointless. It's, like, it's, yeah. like, it's like an art yeah. critic giving them at least a 10 out of 10. It means nothing. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. as yeah. that's what we do, I'm obviously going to give 2001 10 out of 10. Yeah. And Matt, swooping in like the Star Trek, mm. the top things off. <laughs> What's yours? Blowing up nukes left, right, and <laughs> <laughs> Dropping bombs left and right. <laughs> <laughs> Just staring into the camera. Really <laughs> <honestly>. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, isn't it? It's, it's not bad. He, he did pretty well. Um, to say it's iconic, to say it's influential, doesn't scratch the surface of what 2001 is. To say it's got high-minded ambition is putting it mildly. Hmm. And it, it's it's a film that's in that rarefied atmosphere where it's just such a complete one-off. It could have only come from one person, from one person's vision, from one person to be confident enough to go... Arthur C. Clarke, yeah, he'll, he'll work with me. He'll do. He, he, he'll answer my call. <laughs> yeah. He'll do. Yeah. That's the ambition, yeah. the scale of ambition I've got. And Kubrick just refused to make a film that's anything less than something that had never been seen before and has never been seen since. You know, Lords of Apes, Dancing Spaceships, Giant Space Babies, what's not love? Mm -hmm. um, it is the Sistine Chapel of science fiction. It, of course, it's a 10. Yeah, stands by it. Nice full circle. <laughs> yeah, beautiful brilliant beautiful yeah so overall that leaves 2001 with a score of 30 out of 30 though mm. it's above all that obviously of course it is it's, <laughs> it is it's, it's a hundred out of infinity <laughs> or whatever <laughs> <laughs> it's infinity out of infinity beyond the infinite <laughs> yeah it's beyond the yep. infinite it's the stargate of films <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we had doubts we'd get here, but we've made it through 2001, and now we're at the end of the episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should have bought a pat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> if you like this episode and what we do generally, please support us on Patreon. Becoming an ATR on Patreon will get you access to benefits such as bonus episodes of The Cutting Room and also access yeah. to our archive of podcasts. The podcasts are also available on our website. All the classics are in there, so please head over there to have a look. Mainly, though, becoming a Patreon will enable us to carry on making videos and make more of them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We are at the end, though, and this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. So we'll say goodbye <laughs> and thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks for watching, yeah, guys. Thanks really for watching appreciate this it. one, guys. Thank yeah. you. Good. I'm still making yeah, notes here. Uh, so how are you feeling, Westy? Kubrick hasn't sent you over the edge yet? No, no, no. I feel really good about that. That was that was excellent. I think we've got everything in that we needed to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I feel, I feel pretty good about it. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna go and have some tea. I think some some no synthetic it. tea, <laughs> some synthetic <laughs> tea. vegetables as well as you mean. I'll, I'll look at it on me on me little on me little screen. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, I'll see you later. <laughs> All right, mate. Catch All you right. later. <laughs> <laughs> oh. the pod bay doors out. Out. Do you read me out? Out. Open the pod bay doors now. Oh! I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that.